Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's Microsoft Ignite Ask the Expert session hosted by Quest Software. My name is Dan Gauntner, and I'm a Senior Product Marketing Manager with Quest, and uh, I'll be one of your two moderators today. My colleague, Natalie Updike, will also be uh, helping facilitate today's Q&A session around the top challenges with hybrid Active Directory security. And we're going to bring in our two Active Directory security experts, Sean Metcalf and Brian Patton, shortly to help answer some of your questions. But first, I uh, just wanted to run through a couple of housekeeping items. Uh, so uh, this is, of course, a Teams live event. So please use the chat to ask any questions that you have. Um, uh, Natalie and I will be, will be working like crazy, so keep us busy uh, to publish the questions. Uh, and then once they're published, you can use the, uh, the, the thumbs up to like questions and vote on the questions. Uh, we're going to be prioritizing questions with the most votes. Uh, so please, um, you know, take part in, in voting on the questions that you want answered. We will try to get as many uh, to as many questions as possible verbally. We may also answer some through the chat as well. Uh, we have about 30 minutes, so we're going to try to get to as many as possible. Um, of course, uh, the session is going to be recorded. Um, also, please help uh, avoid posting any spam or inappropriate comments uh, in your questions. And of course, uh, adhere to the Microsoft Code of Conduct that you see here and can refer to on this slide. Uh, so with that, uh, I want to turn it over to our experts today that you can uh, ask questions to, Sean Metcalf and Brian Patton. Uh, Sean, maybe why don't you start and give an introduction and then we'll go to Brian. Hi, I'm Sean Metcalf. I'm the founder of Trimark, a professional services company that helps organizations better secure their Microsoft platform, uh, including Microsoft Cloud, Azure AD, and VMware. I'm a Microsoft Certified Master in Active Directory and a Microsoft MVP, and I've spoken at a number of conferences, including DEF CON, Black Hat, Microsoft's Blue Hat, uh, Quest Tech, B-Sides, and others. Um, I'm a security consultant and researcher, and I run adsecurity.org. Over to you, Brian. Sorry about that. I'm Brian Patton out of Dallas, Texas. I am a CISSP. I've been at Quest about 20 years, focusing on everything from migrations to AD management to Active Directory security, including Office 365. Back to you, Sean. Thanks, Brian. So we wanted to start with some public service announcements. Uh, the patch for Zero Logon was released last month, uh, but it wasn't rated very high. Uh, there are now several uh, proofs of concepts or code available to actually exploit this issue. So someone with network access to an unpatched domain controller can compromise your Active Directory. So this is a critical patch for domain controllers. Please patch that ASAP. Also, the Curb TDT is a disabled domain account that is used as a Kerberos service account for the domain. Uh, this account is highly privileged given that it's used for Kerberos ticket operations. Uh, the password for every CurbTTT account in the 84 should change at least twice every year. Uh, we also wanted to mention that with ransomware becoming more prevalent, it's more important than ever to have a solid backup and recovery process and test to make sure it works. Uh, also, if you have Office 365, you probably have Azure AD Connect running on at least one server in your on-prem AD environment. Ensure that this server is protected like a domain controller, since the Azure AD Connect service count is often highly privileged, and Azure AD Connect controls other Azure AD integration services. Uh, finally, Global Administrator has full access to Azure AD, Office 365, and can also control Azure. So severely limit and restrict the accounts that have global admin rights. Uh, make sure that they have MFA enabled. Uh, even better, use Azure Active Directory Privileged Identity Manager, Manager or PIM to leverage just-in-time access. So I also want to go over some key topics uh, that we can talk about and, and answer some questions about. Uh, these key points or key topics. Uh, it's important to recognize that when there are connections between two disparate systems, like your on-prem Active Directory and Azure AD, this provides potential opportunities for attackers. Uh, there are security concerns with pass-through authentication or PTA. Uh, mitigation is basically to protect the Azure AD Connect server like it's a domain controller, uh, as I mentioned earlier. The seamless single sign-on account must be protected since uh, an attacker with knowledge of the account password could impersonate users. Additionally, if an attacker could compromise the Azure AD Connect server, it's possible, depending on the AD configuration, that they could compromise the on-prem Active Directory and jump to Azure AD and compromise that as well. I disclosed earlier this year that an attacker with control of a global administrator account in Azure Active Directory could take control of all associated Azure subscriptions and lock out everyone. So that's important to make sure that these global administrators are well protected. 
uh, leveraging controls such as MFA on your privilege accounts. And again, even better control all your sensitive roles with Azure AD PIM uh, can help retain control of the Microsoft Cloud environment. Uh, Microsoft continues to add security capability, and while it can be very difficult to keep up, uh, review the Ignite announcements in Microsoft's book of news to see what new security features and controls are available. Uh, so with that said, uh, let's turn it over to uh, the chat and see what questions that we have. Again, uh, please publish your question or submit your questions and we'll, we'll publish the ones that uh, publish the ones as they come through and get those uh, rated so that we can answer them. All right, Sean and Brian, uh, put, buckle your seatbelts. We are uh, locked and loaded with a lot of questions. Uh, so this, this should be a pretty fast paced uh, 30 minutes or a little less than 30 minutes. Let's start with, a. Uh, we had a couple questions about AD and Azure AD. So let's start there actually. Uh, what are the main differences between Active Directory and Azure Active Directory? Okay, I'll take that one, Dan. So basically the key difference between Azure Active Directory and Active Directory, I like to say Azure AD is Azure AD and Active Directory is your traditional Active Directory. Um, they are very different. Uh, I have also often said that Azure AD isn't really Active Directory. It doesn't have Kerberos. It doesn't support NTLM. Uh, the typical authentication methods are not there. There is no LDAP, so you can't query Azure AD from LDAP like you can your on-prem AD. There's no group policy. You need something, uh, you need an MDM, something like Intune in order to manage those devices that are joined to Azure AD. So in short, Azure AD is very much a cloud directory uh, that is configured and designed around having multi-tenancy multi uh, and uh, provide that directory as well as uh, the web type authentication methods uh, such as federation. So very different type configuration, very different type system. A lot of the things that we've uh, become familiar with and are used to with our on-prem AD, our Active Directory is very different with Azure AD. Uh, so in short, Azure AD is not really Active Directory. Good question. All right, and let's see. Then probably the top, the next, probably the top voted question. Let's get let's get into that one. So, Patrick asks, any recommendation whether to synchronize domain admin accounts to Azure AD or leave them in the on-prem environment and use different admin accounts for Azure Active Directory? I'll share my thoughts on this one. I mean, in reality, a domain admin account. Really, you shouldn't have any domain admin accounts on premises to begin with. There's the ability to you know delegate out using like the privilege access workstations. I personally would never want to synchronize that out to Azure AD. There's no reason to get those different hashes with the password going out to Office 65. So in reality, I would probably ensure that this is not scoped as part of synchronization from on premises to Azure AD. Any extra thoughts, Sean? Uh, yes, so I, I I agree. There's no reason to synchronize uh, those domain admin accounts, or let's just call them Active Directory admin accounts, up to Azure AD. Uh, we want to keep the administration of those those two environments separate. Uh, to that end, Trimark, uh, the company that I work for, recommends that the uh, accounts that exist and live in, or that are used to manage Azure AD, exist and live in Azure AD. So they're cloud only accounts. Uh, one of the benefits of that is that you can leverage the uh, cloud type MFA that Microsoft provides, uh, as well as an additional capabilities around that, um, such as using PIM. Uh, now, if you have a very well structured um, account lifecycle and provisioning system that then leverages uh, third party MFA uh, through like an Octo or a PIN, Ping or something like that, then it may more make more sense to have a, a synchronized account that is used to manage Azure AD uh, with some controls, but it shouldn't be the same account that manages your, your on-prem AD environment because uh, there are some concerns around that. Uh, like uh, Brian mentioned, uh, especially if you have something like Azure AD domain services, the password hash from your on-prem AD environment could potentially sync over into that into that um, Azure AD domain services, which is very much like an on-prem AD. It's just hosted by Microsoft. Uh, so there are some concerns around that. Uh, I would prefer for most organizations to create uh, accounts in Azure AD, manage them in there, and use PIM for uh, that global administrator role and other roles that are used in order to um, perform the administrative activities that are required for that cloud environment. Great. Uh, next question, what are the best practices for securing service accounts? I, I'm thinking uh, the first thing I think about with service accounts is identifying where the service accounts exist to begin with. 
If I don't know where it is, I can't, you know, identify that it is a service account. After we've identified what the service accounts are, it's all about least privilege access. So, Sean, I've seen you talk about this on Twitter quite a bit. Not everybody needs to have domain admin rights. You can delegate out the different service account for the least privilege. After that, let's ensure that, you know, if it is a service account that's out there, we have a very complex password out there as well that's changed on an ongoing basis. Those are the first three things that come to my mind. What about you, Sean? Yes, absolutely. So um, certainly with the focus being on-prem for service counts, uh, we always talk about making sure that you know what these service counts are, what they're managing. Uh, we often find when we do assessments that customers have service counts and domain admins or other highly privileged groups. And when we talk about what is the service count for, oftentimes we hear that, that Bob or Jane created this and configured it 10, 15 years ago, and no one really knows what it's still for. Uh, so understanding what the account's for, where it logs on, what rights it actually requires uh, is very important because often the vendor will say it needs domain admin rights, or at least that's what it needed 10 or 15 years ago. It's not the case today in many scenarios. Uh, so being able to identify where it's logging on, what it's used for, um, and then making sure that it only has the, the access right it requires, as Brian mentioned, is critical. Now on the Azure AD side, things get a little more complicated because you have different types of rights. You have you can have a service principal or, or service count type uh, account in Azure AD that may have application defined rights. So it may be delegated rights through an application such as being an owner of it, that application or even having direct application rights into the Azure AD environment or to um, potentially user accounts and, and their profiles. Uh, so in that instance, we want to make sure that the same type of uh, a configuration best practices apply. We want to make sure that they are limited in what access or uh, capabilities they have. If we're using roles, then make sure that it's much better to use custom uh, RBAC roles around those search principles as well as other accounts that only need specific rights. Many of times this can be accommodated through global reader versus some of the other more highly privileged rights within the Azure AD environment. Excellent. OK, looks like we have a couple questions around the Azure AD sync process. So let me try to bundle some of these together. Um, first of all, Travis asks, uh, are there any best practices around syncing objects? Um, should you sync all objects, uh, maybe scope specific OUs, for instance, uh, to not sync certain groups or disabled user accounts? Uh, what are your best practices around that, guys? I like putting exclusions for different objects that have no business to be in the cloud to begin with. If a group's just out there for on-premises and it is delegating access to the directory, uh, I think we alluded to this earlier, there's no reason to have that one synced out to Azure AD to begin with. I have seen a lot of organizations, they go ahead by default, they synchronize absolutely everything, and they start using them for absolutely everything in Azure Active Directory, and there's some different caveats there as well. For example, if I'm using a conditional access policy for a group that originated on-premises Active Directory and something happens on-premises, Azure AD Connect will actually just delete it in Azure AD and you'll have no association later on before. So it's really something to think through, what are we really using this group for? What would the value be in you know, Office 65? Right, so my my take on this is we often see that organizations will sync all their security groups up to Azure AD, which to me doesn't make a lot of sense because uh, what is what is the purpose behind that? Uh, I would say I, it, as part of a migration, it's sometimes tough to figure out, okay, what are the groups that actually need to go up there uh, in Azure AD? Certainly from a perspective of migration, we wanna make sure that we have the right user accounts and the groups that they are members of that, that travel with them if they are mail enabled. So that makes sense so that way mail can flow in a hybrid exchange environment where you have exchange on-prem and exchange online. So those group memberships are, are accurate. Uh, once everyone uh, is migrated up to Exchange Online, then sure, it still probably makes sense for those mail-enabled groups to uh, continue being synced and updated because they're probably managed in the on-prem AD. Uh, but certainly not all of them, and I would definitely scope by uh, object type if possible, or even uh, as mentioned uh, by OU, being able to identify those OUs that make sense where the objects in them should be in Azure AD. You definitely don't want to synchronize everything. We've certainly seen this where we see, I don't know, 50,000 or 80,000 groups that are synced up to Azure Active Directory, and then they're there. So 
uh, managing that or seeing what uh, how to how to deal with that can be a little more challenging than perhaps in the on-prem AD environment. Uh, you certainly don't want to synchronize your admin accounts that are only for your on-prem environment. Just from a security perspective, best practices, it doesn't make sense for them to sync up. Um, those accounts really won't be using anything in that environment. Uh, we strongly recommend a second account for administration of that uh, other cloud environment, such as Azure AD or Exchange, or even some of the services that are there. Uh, that way you can separate and segment out those accounts and the, the credentials associated with them. Awesome. And then someone else asked about, you know, with Azure AD syncing from on-prem to the cloud, is it possible to reverse the sync and sync from Azure AD down to on-prem? And, and would, would you ever want to do that? Uh, there is something called password write back where the passwords get synced back. Uh, this is a scenario where you can have users actually change their passwords in Azure AD um, and then leverage that capability of Azure Act Directory and the subscription that's associated with that license that you're paying for. Um, that way it can sync back and then the user can log into Azure AD with that account or their on-prem AD. Uh, from a group perspective, um, I don't know that that's a capability that's available today. The cloud moves very quickly, so it's possible and it's difficult to keep, uh, keep up with all of this. Uh, but I'd say from the perspective of password password sync uh, or password write back as it's called, there are some other attributes that I believe write back as well. Um, so from that perspective, I'd say probably focus on the password reset capability, uh, but for the most part, manage those groups in your on-prem AD. Yeah, and a lot of that I think goes back to what are you truly trying to accomplish? If you're trying to take a functionality of the capabilities Microsoft add around group management in you know, Azure Active Directory, and you want to extend that out to on-premises, but that is where there's third-party tools like Quest that kind of help out there. But it really all goes back to, at the end of the day, what do you want to do? Awesome, and hey, Brian, there might be a question uh, for you. Well, I guess for either of you, but similar uh, on the synchronization process, how can we leverage Azure AD access reviews for groups that have been synced from on-prem AD to Azure AD? Unfortunately, there is no real easy way to be able to do that in Azure Active Directory for a group that originates on-premises, and that may be where most of your different groups originate from. So Quest did have a solution where we created a new product called on-demand group management to address that very concern. So if you're interested, go to our website. We'd be happy to talk about that in more detail. Great. All right, looks like we have some questions on passwords. So let me try to group some of these up too. So Matthew asks, Azure AD doesn't respect on-prem AD's password expiration policy. Are there, are there any good solutions there? That's a good question. I, I don't have a good answer for that. <laughs> Neither do I. Um, I, I would say talk to your Microsoft reps and, and ask for uh, capability there. Uh, there's po it's possible that there's a third party vendor that has some solutions around that, but uh, it, it is a challenge because when you sync uh, from your on-prem AD environment into Azure AD, you have two separate accounts that have uh, effectively a, a primary key link. Um, and that, that enables the password uh, right back uh, and some other capabilities. But from the perspective of, uh, some of the capabilities and the configurations uh, along those lines, yeah, not everything maps entirely, and there are some gaps that are still there. Does Azure AD support multiple password policies? Um, PCI dictates certain very dated password policies that we do not want to roll out to all users. Uh, not to my knowledge. My to, the way I understand it is it's a single password policy. The better thing about Azure AD is that you can. It, there are some banned passwords that are already built into Azure AD, and you can add a custom list of bad passwords that you don't want to uh, get added or, or, or people would leverage. Uh, the nice thing about the way that Microsoft handles this, uh, as well as for the on-prem AD, AD environment through Azure AD password protection, uh, effectively getting away from, all right, passwords are only good if they're 15 characters and they expire every year, to a situation where users can't put in bad passwords anyway and they have to be, say, 12 characters. So that means that any password that has password in the name plus a couple other things is going to be get rejected uh, right away. Um, so approaching it from that angle is certainly better, and I know that the guidance is, is being updated. Uh, NIST has put out updated guidance around this as well, um, talking about passwords should never change. Really, I, I disagree with that, with that take on it, because uh, from my perspective, the NIST document talks more about the controls that you can put in place in order to protect the account 
um, from the types of password attacks that we have today. If you just say no one has to ever change your password, but don't try to add in multi-factor authentication, MFA, or something like a banned password feature, then we're not really solving the problem. We're just we're just stopping users from changing passwords, which we know is an issue anyway, um, because if they can, users are going to change their password from, I don't know, Washington 123 to Washington 124 to Washington 125. On that same token, you know, you can actually originate the different passwords from on premises and delegate out different password policies for different groupings of users that way. But kind of we as we had that, uh, you know, public service announcements earlier, I think another good public service announcement may be to look at your domain level of your on premises AD to see who has that replicating directory changes permission because a lot of those different people have the ability to get those different password hashes and do malicious stuff later on with that permission. Awesome. All right, let's jump to another topic of guest access. So uh, here's a question, uh, one of the top voted questions here. Uh, and remember folks, uh, please remember not only to submit new questions, but also vote on the existing questions. That's where we're gonna pick these off here. So we have found it challenging to manage the large number of guest accounts that are created when collaborating with schools within our university system, which each have their own 365 tenant. What suggestions do you have for provisioning and deprovisioning uh, and ongoing management of those guest accounts. Are there any changes to how guest access will be managed on the Azure AD roadmap? So I can say from the perspective of controlling what guests can actually do is probably the most important part of that. I, I totally understand having a bunch of guest accounts that just are kind of hanging out in, in your tenant uh, and the concerns around that. So I, I take that from a different uh, perspective. Uh, by default, guests can invite other guests and have uh, view ability into your uh, your tenant and your uh, your accounts and membership of groups that's there. So I would say start focusing on locking down the the guest access and what they're able to do, and focus on it from that perspective. Once you've locked down what guests are actually able to do in your environment, check to see if if you're using Teams, uh, which teams are actually configured to allow guests into uh, those teams. Uh, if that's appropriate for your organization, then make sure that it's well defined or at least note, note it which teams actually have guests. Um, so I would take it from the approach of what guests are able to do or, or what they're able to see and have visibility into in your environment. Um, and and certainly I, I've heard this concern. I've seen environments with say 30,000 guest accounts um, that are kind of lingering and, and continue to increase. Um, I don't know that there's a good story around that from the Microsoft management perspective, or at least built in natively to, to Azure AD. Um, but I would say, at least right now, focus on what they're able to do and controlling that access and that capability. Gotcha. A, a couple questions around break glass accounts. So Chris in particular asks, uh, what are the best practices for a break glass admin account? Ours is excluded from MFA conditional access policies in order to give us a way back in especially since we're a, a small company with just two admins. Uh, but what, what are your best practices around that, guys? Uh, Microsoft's best practices is, is best practices around that at this point in time is that you have two. Uh, the guidance is that one is excluded from conditional access and one is excluded from MFA. Uh, Microsoft has a really good document around that. Uh, I would also recommend that you go ahead and configure a FIDO2 token for each of those accounts. Um, note what the, what the pin is for those and put them into a safe. Uh, so that way you have kind of a break glass access to your emergency accounts. Um, so that's a strong way to do it. You do have to definitely exclude at least one of those accounts from your conditional access policies to make sure you don't get locked out, because if you do get locked out through conditional access, uh, it's it's a really bad day for everyone. So um, making sure that the you have these additional capabilities to get back in and work around the configurations, especially if someone makes a mistake, uh, configuring these conditional access policies. Certainly configuring them in reporting mode first, going through a, a some sort of change notification or review process before a, a conditional access policy goes live is, is a great way to do that. Gotcha. Okay, here's a question around the zero logon vulnerability. Um, Azure pass-through authentication seems to use an internal, sorry, Azure pass-through authentication seems to use an internal computer account with Kerberos delegation. Might there be a problem with zero logon vulnerability? Yes, absolutely. So one of the th interesting things about that is with that that account it is a computer account. Uh, Azure AD Connect spins that up, sets a password initially for it, but it never changes. Uh, so 
it, Microsoft does recommend that this this account password actually change and has some guidance around that. Um, thanks to some security res uh, security researcher that, that did some research and published some information, um, kind of poked Microsoft to make sure that there's some guidance around this. Uh, with zero login, you have the capability through a domain controller that's unpatched in order to change a password for an account, uh, specifically a computer account. So uh, it, it could be possible to leverage that for for uh, this this computer account that's used as part of this Azure AD Connect uh, integration. Uh, so definitely want to make sure that DCs get patched because I, I think obviously the obvious issue is compromising Active Directory, but I think there's going to be some uh, lower order of magnitude uh, type issues and, and uh, situations that, that get kind of teased out over the next couple months as we figure that out. Okay, we've been, uh, and folks, we're probably going to have time for two, maybe three more questions. We're running up on our time. It went really fast. Uh, we've been kind of getting a little specific. Maybe let's up level it with a question here. Uh, so maybe, Brian, what are the best ways to protect and secure Azure AD uh, within Office 365? What are the best ways to protect and secure Azure AD with Microsoft does a lot around you. Know, protecting and securing Azure AD with the service that's already provided. My biggest thing is, you know, making sure you have the recovery capabilities in place for any attributes that may get modified, group memberships that may get changed, uh, things of that nature. Um, I mean, just use the functionality that's already out there. If you have P1 capabilities, P2 capabilities, use what's out there and configure them. It's kind of like your old on-premises Active Directory. It's only as good as it is configured. So look at all the different options are available to you and configure those different options. Yeah, I, I would definitely recommend, um, as we said before, global admins and sensitive uh, sensitive roles that are controlled and, and covered, uh, managed by Azure AD PIM. Also making sure that you regularly review any uh, Azure, AD, Azure AD application permissions, especially at the tenant level. Um, and look at the subscription that you have and the capabilities that you get with that um, and, and start working through that. Secure score is a good pointer to a number of those, um, but as Microsoft announces new capabilities and features at your subscription level, uh, definitely to take a look at that. I know it's been a little bit confusing over the past couple of years with an Office 365, E3 and E5, and then the Microsoft 365, E3 and E5, which is a superset, which kind of included that plus the Azure AD uh, capabilities. So the subscriptions get kind of complicated, uh, but there are definitely some solid security capabilities within the platform, and a number of those you actually have to implement. With PIM, you can do that with Azure ADP2 licenses just for your admin accounts. You don't need Azure ADP2 for everyone. Gotcha. Okay, last uh, question that we have time for today. Um, what can break when the... Um, KRB TGT is that the Kerberos Golden Ticket account password is reset. So if you ever reset that, you don't want to do it really fast unless you've been breached. Uh, by doing it fast, you got to remember Active Directory remember the last two different passwords. Resetting it at one time isn't really going to affect everything. So typically the best practice is reset it once, make sure replication's gone all the way through, and then you can reset it again. And that's really to help mitigate, you know, any kind of golden tickets or forged tickets maybe on the network. So any application that uses Kerberos via the double tap, it's going to take a little while till you know we can actually you know regain you know the different Kerberos ticket to begin working again. So I've I've definitely heard of bad things happening when you when you change the Kerb TDT password rapidly. Um, definitely a, a, a solid approach is to change it once, make sure that it, uh, the replication converges so all your domain controllers in the Active Directory domain get that change uh, and then update that uh, across all of them so you have the convergence. Um, our typical recommendation is to change it one week and then change it a week later um, because as Brian mentioned, uh, the Curb TTT computer account is going to have the current uh, password and the previous password and so until it gets all the all the DCs get what the what the current one is, which which then the current one 
the old current one becomes the previous one, uh, and then the new current one is the new current one. So it needs to be able to know what those are in order to open up Kerberos tickets and actually authenticate them. Uh, bad things can happen if you change them even within the same 10 hours or 12 hours because there are tickets that are already out there, especially on some Unix devices that tend to cache some of that information, have trouble with um, the, the curb TTT getting changed too quickly. We have some customers that even change it one month and then change it again a month later. That's fine. It just should be changed every year, twice. At least. <laughs> awesome. Well, hey, thanks everyone for, uh, gosh, uh, really a flood of questions. We're so, we apologize that we didn't have time to answer them all today. Uh, since we are running short on time, I wanted to quickly talk about two next steps that you can take with Quest. And the first one I want to cover is another virtual conference actually coming up called Tech, the Experts Conference. Uh, Tech 2020 is a free virtual conference held November 17th and 18th, and it's focused on providing technical training and insight focused on three tracks. And we're talking 300 to 400 level sessions around hybrid Active Directory security, which is right up the alley of this audience, Office 365 and migration and modernization. Now Quest puts on this event for the community, but it's not a Quest product user conference. The sessions are actually delivered by uh, Microsoft employees, uh, such as Chris McNulty, Pam Dingle, Greg Taylor, and many more but also industry experts and MVPs like Randy Franklin Smith and David Kennedy, Tony Redmond, and also you, Sean. Uh, Sean, do you actually wanna just maybe tell the audience quickly uh, what your session at Tech is going to be about? Sure, uh, yeah, I'm speaking at uh, Tech about hybrid act hybrid cloud security, which includes uh, on-prem and, and Azure AD. I, I go into a lot more detail on the topics I touched on throughout this very short session and cover several other hybrid cloud topics. I talk about uh, what is the security posture of Azure AD domain services versus other hosted Active Directories. I talk about attacks that attackers could, could leverage in an environment if they are able to compromise your Azure AD Connect server or uh, some of these other uh, integrate, uh, cloud integration components. So absolutely go into much further detail into that um, and I'm looking forward to it. Thank you. Thanks, and a, and a great benefit uh, with tech is that, especially this year when, when there hasn't been as many in-person uh, in uh, conferences, is that you guys can earn up to 17 CPE credits uh, for attending the virtual sessions at tech. Uh, so register for free at the URL listed on the slide, theexpertsconference.com, theexpertsconference.com. The second call to action with Quest, we had a flood of questions. We wanna get to more of your questions. Um, so th there's two things that you can do with Quest. Uh, first of all, if you've been to an Ignite in years past, you know that we're, uh, we're known for giving away pretty cool t-shirts. And even though this year's Ignite is virtual, we didn't want to disappoint you guys. So we want to give away to everyone in, in the audience here this GOAT Sys Admins shirt. Uh, that's awesome. You can see, here, see it here on the slide. Uh, but there is a limited supply. Uh, so here's what you need to do. Uh, open a browser right now. Uh, right now, open a browser. Type in quest.com slash questignite. That's, that's not actually gonna take you off of the Ignite page. That's, that's really just a vanity URL, quest.com slash questignite. It'll take you to our featured partner profile page. You can click on that to the registration page to get your t-shirt um, and then uh, do it right now because they are running fast. Uh, but also after you sign up, if you wanna get some of your questions uh, answered that we didn't get to, we do have uh, experts standing by to chat with you around any questions you have around hybrid Active Directory security. So uh, Sean and Brian, thank you so much uh, for taking the time, uh, providing your insight to everyone in, in the audience here. And thanks all of you for joining us for this uh, Microsoft Ignite Ask the Experts session hosted by Quest. Uh, we wanna wish you uh, luck securing your Active Directory and we hope you enjoy the rest of Microsoft Ignite. Thank you everyone and have a great uh, rest of the show. Thank you.